So in the second part of the notebook, we can now focus on actually implementing just the different models. And we use here then PyTorch Lightning to just simplify our training. So let's, as the first model, let's look at Inception or in general, Google Net. So the Google Net was proposed in 2014 and had as novelty these Inception blocks, which we have visual, uh, visualized below here. So the general intuition is that if we have a layer, so a feature map, we actually look at it with different uh, layers in parallel. So we look at it with a one by one convolution, of three by three, a five by five, and also max pooling. And this gives us also just a uh, well, more semantic field. And therefore also we can check for example, for different scalings of objects, which has been also one of the contributions of the inception module. It is quite simple to implement, um, but this module itself is also called Inception V1, and there exist many more, so there's already Inception V2, 3, and 4, and also Inception ResNet, uh, which, for example, then combines Inception and ResNet together. So therefore you see that there is a lot of work also still on Inception, um, but here we just want to do the basic one, because from the basic one you can understand all the other contributions here. So the inception block you can see above, and let's just try to implement it as a PyTorch module. It's not that difficult to actually do that, so what we do is um, we define as input parameter C in, so number of input channels we get from the previous layer. The C red is basically the reduction, so you will see we have here one by one convolutions, which uh, before with 3 by 3 and 5 by 5, which take the input features, reduce them, to have find a more parameter efficient uh, 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 convolution. This is also because we stack all of these filters afterwards together, meaning that we actually have always a large size of filter uh, channels. And here we can just uh, reduce it and therefore are more parameter efficient. This is why we define here a dictionary, which uses then 3 by 3 and 5 by 5. And then we have the C out, which is basically the number of output channels for the one by one and all the other output uh, strings. And then you can just see here, we define the one by one convolution as a convolution with batch normal activation function. Usually we will use the activation function of whale, but we generalize it here just in case you want to play around again with activation functions with the graphy convolution. So also we first do a one by one reduction with batch norm and then again f3 by 3 with batch norm. And the 5 by 5 is exactly the same, just with a kernel size of 5 and padding of 2, because now we also want to still stick to the 32 by 32 input. And the max pooling is also nothing different. So we first max pool, but with a stride of 1. So we don't use max pool to actually reduce the resolution. We just use it to uh, have an additional uh, filter and use then again a 1 by 1 convolution with batch norm and activation function. The forward path, we then execute them all and concatenate um, finally as an output. So it's actually quite simple to implement in PyTorch. The Google Net is then just using the inception blocks as a stack. So we have defined here now a nn.module class, which takes here first some hyperparameters for some activation function, number of classes, um, and then we create our network and initialize the parameters. So in create network, you see we first use a small input network, with, which is basically just a convolution of batch norm and activation function. We do this beforehand because we don't want to operate just on the 3 by 3 For example, for one by one convolution wouldn't really help anything if we just apply the inception directly on the input image and especially also the reduction um, convolutions. Well, here then we just scale it up to 64. And then you see here we apply a sequence of inception blocks with max pooling occasionally in between to reduce the dimensions. The channel sizes here, you see the 32, 64, and so on, they are hand picked. They were also hand picked in the original Google Net. I designed them in this, um, well, with a perspective of having the same hyperparameters of the same parameter size for ResNet, GoogleNet, and DenseNet, so we can compare them quite fairly. 
feel free to also play with them around. You can, of course, increase them, but therefore also the model gets more expensive in running. The output net here is basically just taking the output of the last inception block, taking an average pool, flattens the output so we can apply a linear layer on it to predict our 10 classes. The initialization, as you know, if we apply again, um, or from the previous tutorial, you have seen that we do initialization with a k-mean initialization, and here when we use as nonlinearity, of course, whichever we use, um, which basically calculates us the gain in case we don't use Willu, but for example, Lake we do. The forward is then just running all of them in sequence. So we can do that here. And below here, we just add basically the class to our dictionary so we can also access it by the trainer and we train it here below. So we just have to say in our train model, we say it's a Google net, 10 classes with a real activation, we use Adam with 1e e minus 3 and a rate decay of 1e e minus 4. So then below here, you see that Hydrogen Lightning is running, which basically takes us and then founds the pre model and tests it on both the uh, validation and the test set. We can then let's just maybe print here the results um, for now, but later we will actually compare all of the three models, Inception, Resident, and DenseNet on the results. So this is just basically first peek at the results. As I said, then uh, PyTorch Lightning helps us a lot with actually logging and logging in the sense that we have a default TensorBot logger and we can now start to actually look at the TensorBot. So TensorBot is integrated here in PyTorch and we can just run it by loading the extension here in our Jupyter Notebook TensorBot and you can run it by saying TensorBot log directory. So depending on where you have your models, I've had it's right now in Safe Models Tutorial 5, TensorBot's Google Net. And if you run it, you should see that the TensorBot is slowly launched. And once it's loaded, which takes always a little bit of time uh, because it's a large environment. And there you see now, you can actually see the number of epochs, for example, the learning rate. So on the x-axis here, we see for this one, the number of epochs. Well, on the y-axis, then the learning rate we had. So we started with 1e-3, e had then a scheduler to reduce it by a factor of 10. So here 1e-4 e and finished 1e-5. E you can also look at the training accuracy, for example. There you see our model achieved 99% at training accuracy. So it was really good at the training. While on the validation, if we look at it, it actually is quite some worse. Um, which shows that we probably overfitted on the training data set, all for using all the virtualization. Of course, you can use more virtualization to uh, even prevent it more, but this is not the focus of this tutorial. The other part of TensorBot, which is nice, is we can look at the graphs. So if you type the graph, it actually shows you uh, the computation graph we had for, with the example input array. So this is the input, this is the output. And if you double click, on a module it opens. And then you see that we have here the Google Net module, which has the input net, the output net, and here our stack of inceptions, right? And you can also click on it. And there you see all our, uh, actually our model then visualized, which had the sequence of inception blocks, the max pooling, and so on. And this helps you a lot to actually understand what you have coded to make sure that the computation graph is exactly as you want it. And feel free to play around with it and actually explore the model more and more uh, because it's just also nice visualization of the model actually. So this is now Google Net and next we can look at ResNet. ResNet is currently actually one of the most cited AI papers um, and have a very simple idea of these residual connections. Which basically say instead of saying XL plus one is F of XL, we actually say the next output is just the previous output plus a change, which we define then with f of xl. And this helps especially with deep uh, neural networks because we have these, this identity matrix in our derivation. There are multiple different versions of ResNet. Uh, the standard ResNet, which is shown here on the left, is basically uh, defined as having f as a convolution batch norm will again a convolution batch norm adds it to the 
um, previous input and then applies the real loop here. So the activation function is applied in this uh, stream, which is where you always added something. This can cause uh, troubles, especially if you go very, very, very deep, because you see if you do real loop, half of the gradients are again capped, right? Uh, just because half of it is set to zero. While here, a different idea of uh, another ResNet block, which is called pre-activation ResNet block, is to move actually this activation function into the input 2f. So basically it takes this XL, so the stream in the residual network, and pushes it first through batch domain real loop. So it has a non-linearity on which it then can apply convolutions um, to again, well, to basically the operations in the neural network. And then adds it. There you see if we now do a backpropagation step from all the last layer here, it just goes through with identity metrics without any problems. Well, here we always had the ReLU in between. So the more ReLUs you apply, the more sparse, of course, the gradients get from the output to the input. This is why the pre-activation REST network is usually used for very deep networks. However, we can just maybe implement both of them so you can see what is actually the difference. ResNet, so let's start with a simple ResNet block. You see just we use SF here, our convolution patch norm activation function convolution patch norm. So exactly what we have found or what we have seen before in the picture. While there is one addition um, as a parameter, you know what we call here subsample. And this is in the case for the ResNet blocks where we actually want to decrease the image resolution. So in the inception network, we have used max pooling, but in inception, we want in ResNet, so we want to make sure that actually nothing uh, is directly applied or uh, very little is applied to the, res, um, to the stream. And therefore we use here uh, in the original one, it actually used a one by one convolution with a stride of two. So it basically means we take the left upper pixel for each two by two and just apply a one by one convolution and skip all the other three pixels in the surrounding. This gives us then the opportunity to decrease the image while still doing um, basically a residual connection. And that's what we apply here. So we run f, the leave a function, so we then add here the residual connection and apply the activation function. In case we downsample, then we first downsample x. Therefore, we can run it here and just have it. The second block is then pre-activation ResNet, and there you see that we first apply batch norm, then the activation function, then the convolution, and then the second block. And the downsampling also looks a bit different because we first have to apply batch norm in it. The activation function and then can apply convolution. And basically the output, you see that we don't apply activation function on the output on the added one. These are basically the main differences. You will see also in different implementations, here we use the one by one convolution for downsampling, which is for original implementation. Other implementations use, for example, average pooling or uh, other ideas, while it actually has all similar effects. We then add, basically create here a dictionary, so we can again choose between blocks given a string. And the ResNet overall, you'll see, is just basically uh, multiple ResNet blocks stacked together with occasional uh, subsampling in between. To define them, we use here a notation which also is used in the Torch Vision package uh, for defining ResNet or for creating a ResNet. Namely, we have here a list of number of blocks which mean after, so we first apply the ResNet blocks and then apply one downsampling one with two more um, residual blocks and then again downsampling and again so two. So it basically tells us, okay, we have three stacks of three uh, ResNet blocks and where we actually want to downsample. And we see hidden is basically the hidden sizes for the different um, block stacks here. So it's also nothing too exciting if we create the network. Here we also have to then the input network. So again, we take the uh, input image and then scale it up first in the number of dimensions, in the number of channels, 
and then apply all our ResNet blocks on it. If we use a pre-activation ResNet block, remember we don't want to apply any non-linearity, so we just have a convolution, while here we have a batch norm and the activation function for the original ResNet. And then this function or this loop is basically just adding our blocks with our hyperparameters we want and stacks them together in a sequential one. The output network is exactly the same um, as for the inception and we also initialize it in a similar way. We just use here the mode of fan out because in the original implementation they also used fan out uh, initialization and we just want to do it as close to uh, the original implementation. So let's also define it here and we can define our ResNet to our model dictionary. One difference to uh, the inception Google network is that we will use SGD instead of Adam. This is because we have seen or also in these experiments, so feel free to also run ResNet with Adam, but usually it performs a little lower than with SGD. There are many theories and also papers uh, about why that might be the case. It is not 100% clear, so you can't give one 100% answer. But one idea uh, which is currently out there and mostly convincing is that if you introduce these skip connections, you actually have a much smoother loss surface. So in one paper um, in 2018, they tried to visualize the loss surface here on the left for network when you don't have skip connections and on the right if you have skip connections. You see that it's just much smoother because you just change but you add a little with each layer to the features instead of replacing them completely. Um, on these surfaces, as we have seen in the previous tutorial 4, um, Adam might over-optimize, so it might find these mini uh, optima while well, SGD is then better in finding these large white minima, which is basically the one we are looking for. This is why often SGD performs a little better, but it's always a good hyperparameter for ResNets to check both Adam and SGD. So let's train here first our standard ResNet, now here with the SGD and momentum, and below here we will train then the ResNet with a pre-activation function, so both have been pre-trained, and we just have to evaluate them on, um, on our test set. Again, we have here TensorBot logs we can look at. So please feel free to go through the TensorBot, play around to see actually more things. Um, right now here, I just want to show you how the validation accuracy and training accuracy looks like in uh, the ResNet, because it is quite a bit different. You see that also, again, this jump here from the validation accuracy is when we reduce the learning rate. And before we reduce the learning rate, it is quite some worse than the inception, when the, uh, when the Google Net. Well, after the first change in, uh, in the learning rate, you see we have a bigger jump. We actually get a higher validation accuracy. Same in the train, you also see these jumps, which are caused by actually reducing the learning rate, because we are now able to find the smaller optimum.